This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. Good day, students. We'll talk about the foundations of electric motors today. Electric motors are essential parts in many industries because they transform electrical energy into mechanical energy. The several kinds of electric motors, their working theories and their applications will all be discussed in this lecture. Let's first talk about the fundamental categories of electric motors, direct current or DC motors, and alternating current or AC motors are the two basic kinds. While AC motors use a variable voltage source to produce a sinusoidal torque waveform, DC motors imply a constant voltage source to produce a continuous torque. Brushed and brushless DC motors are the two most popular varieties. While brushless motors use electronic commutation, brushed motors use physical brushes to deliver current to the rotor. Increasingly, more people are using brushless motors because of their excellent efficiency, low maintenance requirements, and long lifespan. DC motors are frequently used in electric cars, toys, and a variety of home products. Synchronous and induction motors are the two main categories of AC motors. The speed at which synchronous motors run is directly proportional to the supply frequency. On the other hand, induction motors employ electromagnetic induction to generate torque that is a little bit slower than the supply frequency. Industrial settings, pumps, fans, and other large-scale applications frequently employ AC motors. It's crucial to comprehend the fundamental operational ideas of electric motors. Electromagnetism, which asserts that an electric current produces a magnetic field and that a magnetic field can induce an electric current, forms the basis of how electric motors work. An electric motor's rotor, which houses the conducting windings, is its most important part. A magnetic field is produced as electric current passes through these windings, and this interaction produces a mechanical force that propels the rotor into rotation. The stator is also a crucial component of electric motors. Either permanent magnets or electromagnetic windings are present in the stator, which surrounds the rotor. To create torque in a motor, the magnetic fields of the stator and rotor interact. The motor design, voltage, and current are only a few of the variables that affect the torque produced. Electric motors are essential to contemporary life because they offer a safe, dependable, and efficient way to transform electrical energy into mechanical energy. Electric motors are now more effective and compact thanks to technological developments, which enables their incorporation into a greater variety of applications. Electric motors will only become increasingly essential to our daily lives and industries as long as we keep innovating. In conclusion, electric motors are crucial elements in the process of converting electrical energy to mechanical energy. They can be divided into two groups, DC motors and AC motors. Every kind has particular operational ideas and uses. Electromagnetism is used by electric motors to produce torque, which eventually powers their mechanical motion. Electric motors will continue to play a bigger and bigger role in our lives as technology develops. What is the main idea of a lecture?
What did the professor mean when she said? Electric motors will only become increasingly essential to our daily lives and industries as long as we keep innovating. Why does the professor discuss both the rotor and stator in electric motors? What is the primary distinction between brushed and brushless DC motors? Which of the following is a common application for AC motors? Sort the following items as part of electric motors, or not part of electric motors. Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, Professor. I hope you're doing well. I was wondering if you could give me some feedback on my recent homework assignment. Sure. I'd be happy to help. First of all, I liked the overall structure of your work. However, I think there's still some room for improvement. I appreciate your feedback. Could you please specify what I need to improve on? For instance, in the second paragraph, you could expand upon the argument you presented by including more supporting evidence. All right, I'll take that into consideration. Was there anything else that caught your attention? Another area to work on would be your conclusion. It needs a bit more of a compelling closing statement to wrap up your thoughts effectively. Thank you, Professor. I'll make sure to revise those sections. I'm really trying to get a good grade in this class. I can see that you've put in the effort. Keep in mind that refining your writing skills will take time, but with practice, you'll get there. I appreciate your guidance, Professor. I'll try my best to apply your suggestions in my future assignments. That's the spirit. Feel free to reach out if you have any more questions or need assistance. Good luck with your revisions. Professor, do you have any advice on how to stay motivated during the revision process? A good approach is to break your revisions into smaller tasks and set specific goals for each session. This can help you stay focused and maintain a sense of progress. What is the main idea of the dialogue?
What is the professor implying in their feedback? How does the student feel when discussing their grade in the class? What is the professor's attitude towards the student's effort? What aspect of the homework does the professor suggest to improve in the conclusion? Now listen to the lecture. Hello there, students. We will explore the extraordinary world of Spanish sculptor and artist Eduardo Shehida today. Shehida, a prolific sculptor who was born in 1924, made a significant impression on the art world with his amazing body of work. He achieved a famous name both in Spain and abroad thanks to his original and thought-provoking approach to sculpture and form. Let's first look at Shahida's early professional years. He was actually a student of architecture before deciding to pursue a career in the arts. But it didn't take him long for his artistic tendencies to direct him toward sculpture. We shall later examine how his training in architecture contributed to the creation of his distinctive aesthetic and style. The three fundamental topics of Eduardo Shahida's work were space, material, and form. He experimented with a range of materials during his career, including iron, wood, and alabaster. His preoccupation with these components allowed him to produce sculptures that questioned conventional ideas of shape and space, creating fresh connections between the viewer and the artwork. The Piene del Viento, or the Wind Comb, a group of enormous steel sculptures on the shoreline of San Sebastian, Spain, is one of Shahida's most recognizable pieces. These sculptures inspire a strong sensation of awe in the viewer in addition to demonstrating his mastery of material and form. It is noteworthy that Shahida's art frequently explores the powers of nature, which served as the inspiration for this particular piece. It's fascinating to see how Shahida's background in architecture has affected his sculpture. His expertise in architecture is evident in, for example, how we can control space to create a sense of equilibrium and harmony between the artwork and its surrounds. Additionally, he was able to stretch the limits of traditional sculpting, producing groundbreaking and inspirational pieces as a result. Eduardo Shahida occasionally experimented with various art forms, even though the main themes of his work were space, material, and form, his venture into printmaking is just one illustration of how he can adapt his artistic vision to many media. In conclusion, Eduardo Shehida was a revolutionary Spanish sculptor who had a lasting impression on the art world.
He is a remarkable person in the history of art because of his singular method of working with sculpture and his research of space, substance, and form. His groundbreaking ideas and method are still an inspiration to modern artists. Therefore, his influence is still felt today. What is the main idea of the lecture? In the lecture, the professor mentions Chile de Spen del Viento. Why does the professor bring up this particular work? How does the professor feel when discussing Pendel Viento? Why does the professor mention Chile does foray into printmaking? Sort the following themes according to whether they were part of Chilita's work or not. What was Eduardo Chilida's initial field of study before pursuing sculpture? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Excuse me, I received a parking ticket on campus and I'm not sure what to do next. Oh, I see. You'll need to pay the fine within 30 days. You can do this online, by mail, or in person at our office. I didn't even know I was parked in a restricted area. The sign wasn't very clear. Unfortunately, that's not a valid excuse. It's important to thoroughly read and understand parking signs on campus. I understand, but I'm a bit short on cash right now. Is there any way I can get an extension on the payment? We can't offer extensions, but we do have a payment plan option. This would allow you to make smaller payments over a few months. I appreciate the offer, but I'm still not sure I can afford it. What happens if I don't pay the fine on time? Well, if the fine isn't paid within 30 days, an additional late fee will be added. Also, unpaid fines 
can lead to a hold on your academic records. That doesn't sound good. I guess I'll just have to find a way to pay it on time. I understand it can be difficult, but it's essential to follow the rules and pay the required fines. I'm sure you'll find a way to manage it. All right. I guess I'll opt for the payment plan then. Can you help me with setting it up? Of course. I'll guide you through the process. We'll need some basic information, and you can choose the duration for the payment plan. What is the main idea of the dialogue? What is the administrator implying when they mention the payment plan option? How does the student feel about the parking fine? What is the administrator's attitude toward the student's situation? What will happen if the student doesn't pay the fine on time? Now listen to the lecture. Good day, students. Today we'll delve into the intriguing and diverse world of Scandinavian vegetation. Scandinavia, as you may know, is a part of Northern Europe that includes the nations of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Due to a unique combination of elements, including latitude, climate, and geological history, the vegetation in this area is highly distinctive. Let's begin by looking at the primary plant species that can be found in Scandinavia. The coniferous forest, mixed deciduous woodland, and alpine or arctic tundra are the three main ecological zones. The most prevalent vegetation in Scandinavia is coniferous forest, which is composed primarily of spruce and pine trees. 
These woods are distinguished by their heavy cover of trees, chilly winters, and rather warm summers. As you travel south, you'll come across mixed deciduous forest, which are composed of a mix of deciduous and coniferous trees, including beech, oak, and elm. The majority of these woods may be found in Denmark, as well as the southern regions of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Last but not least, the treeless alpine or arctic tundra is characterized by low-growing plants, grasses, and mosses. In Scandinavia's far north and high mountain regions, this zone is most prevalent. Let's now talk about the variables that have influenced Scandinavian vegetation over time. The kinds of plants that are still abundant in this area now are mostly a result of the Ice Age, which ended around 12,000 years ago. A region that had been initially settled by pioneering species, like birch and willow, was left behind as the ice receded. The vast range of plant life that we observe now was established over time as different species slowly migrated into the area. The Scandinavian climate has influenced the region's vegetation in addition to its geological past. You may be aware that the warm ocean circulation known as the Gulf Stream moderates the climate in Western Europe. Its impact is less noticeable in Scandinavia, where the environment is colder and more hostile than one might anticipate at these latitudes. The vegetation in Scandinavia therefore resembles the subarctic region more so than the temperate zone. The vegetation of Scandinavia has also been shaped by human activity. People in this area have used agricultural methods that have changed the local environment for generations. Slash and burn agriculture, which is widely practiced and has produced a patchwork of open meadows and recovering forest, is one illustration of this. Some species that might not have thrived in their natural habitat have been able to do so because of these perturbations. In conclusion, the distinct geological history, climate, and human activity of Scandinavia have resulted in the formation of a rich and diversified vegetation that is still changing now. It will be interesting to see how this dynamic ecosystem responds to and changes as environmental conditions change. What is the main idea of a lecture? What does the professor imply about the vegetation in Scandinavia? How does the professor feel about Scandinavian vegetation? What did the professor mean when they said? 
The vast range of plant life that we observe now was established over time as different species slowly migrated into the area. In the lecture, the professor mentioned the influence of the Gulf Stream on the climate of Scandinavia. What did they mean by this? Which of the following statements about the mixed deciduous forests is not true, based on the lecture? 